So we're continuing our series on this sermon that Jesus gives. Before I read this part, I've said it would be so much easier if Jesus would only just say really simple, easy things. <laughs> Not challenging hard stuff or complex stuff. Uh, but he doesn't. He doesn't avoid that. Uh, he doesn't act that being human is hard and complicated and trying to do it uh, while following God and being in relationship with God and with others is hard. So we'll go into that on this day that we talk about love, um, some of the harder things he says. He says, you have heard it said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on your way to court with him or her. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. So, you know, easy stuff. No problem. Um, these are messy and complicated passages, and we have preached on them for a long time. Jesus doesn't avoid the hard or the complicated or the messy parts of being a human, like the topics that he brings up today about what it means to be in the world and the complicated nature of that. But I'm also very aware of the history of how these passages have been misused for years. Uh, and so in some ways I have to start with what we're not going to do. So in some ways people have used these when Jesus does this, but I have said, or you have heard, but I have said that he's suggesting that the Jewish, we should throw out the Jewish laws or the Jewish laws were bad or we should be anti-Jewish about it. We're not going to do that today. <laughs> um, we aren't going to um, shame people or control people into staying in unhealthy or dangerous situations or justifying unhealthy ideas around um, bodies and purity. We're not going to do that. In many ways, this is like the passages about the blessings where these things that don't seem to be connected, how are they connected to each other? Um, similar to that, they're supposed to remind us of the Ten Commandments of these commandments and laws that God gave Israel and gave us. And what ties them all together is about how we're going to be a community. How are we going to live and love and be faithful together? And what kind of community is that going to be? And what Jesus wants us to think about this community is how people are treated in this community, how they are loved or not loved, how they are seen or not seen. And these laws were given to us all those years ago in order to be righteous, which is one of those like very churchy words that we use that we can apply a bunch of things to. But the more I researched it this week, the more people I read about it, is it had to do with the idea of being in right relationship with God, and it means being in right relationship with people. So... You want to know how to do that. So one of the ways is God laid out these Ten Commandments, as cl a clear as possible way to do that. You do it by worshiping only God. You don't worship idols. You don't 
use God's name in vain or oaths you can't keep. You rest on the Sabbath. You honor those who came before you. You don't murder, steal, lie, or covet what you don't have. So all of those, the whole purpose of those laws was to help or form a community based around shalom. Righteousness and right relationship is about being in shalom. First, it was for the people of Israel. Then it was meant to be for the whole world, to bring everyone into this sense of shalom. So righteousness is right relationship. And shalom is a Hebrew word meaning peace, harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, and tranquility. That sounds pretty good. That sounds like a community we want. The other thing I really like that I learned is shalom can be used as a greeting. You can say shalom for hello, but you can also say shalom for goodbye. So I love that this community is supposed to be when you enter it, when you are greeted with wholeness, peace, harmony, completeness, prosperity, welfare, and tranquility. And it should be the same when you leave us. You should experience these things. It is our hello. It is our goodbye. God wants this right relationship, this shalom so much, it's why there were so many rituals and practices and laws to explain these Ten Commandments, to to pull them out even more in-depthly. And they weren't, so often we see them as either restrictive or exclusive, but they're not meant to keep us from God. They're there so that we can keep being in relationship, bring us back into right relationship with God over and over and over again. In the First Testament, they explain again and again the ways the world is just going to be complicated and messy and difficult, and we're humans in it, and cultures and other communities, they're going to think, and they're going to live, and they're going to have different practices than us. So in order for us to stay in right relationship with God, for us to be in shalom and with each other, we're going to behave and practice in these ways laid out in the commandments and in all the laws and the rituals in order to re-enter that relationship. And so Jesus isn't writing new laws. He's just even deepening them or or exploring them, kind of the source of the problems. And he's talking about before we can be in right relationship with God, we have to be in right relationship with each other. When he talks about, like, don't go offering your gift to God if you're still wrestling in this relationship and this struggle with other people in your community. And he points out the ways that sometimes the laws are set up in unequal ways or unfair ways or used for loopholes or ways we sidestep them. But what he's trying to do in these examples is to help us to examine our heart in the situation or the source of these situations. Not just our ability to do or not do certain actions or things, but where our heart is at the start of it. And they're straight out of the Ten Commandments. You know, don't swear by God's name. Don't keep make promises or oaths you can't keep. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. And he says, right, we should not do these. That's in the top ten. That's the starting point. But they're also an invitation to check where our heart is. We may not all murder, but we all experience anger. And we know the dangers that can come from that. What's the source of us doing or not doing these actions? Is it simply an act of self-control, of being nice? Or does it come from a heart with a desire for something bigger? For a community based around shalom? It's one of the things I think that connect some of these actions, not all of them, is that it can... One word is dehumanize, but like when I'm angry with somebody, when I can be angry enough at them, I can see them as less than, not as deserving, somehow changing their dignity, but it also changes me about those we direct our anger to or who we're unfaithful to or who our oaths apply to some but not to others. Jesus is asking to examine our hearts around these issues, but he's doing this interesting thing, this incredibly old practice. He's inviting the crowd into this larger conversation around the commandments, 
around the ways we examine these things, this wonderful Jewish practice that we try to continue as Christian, which is he treats the scriptures like they're a living word. It's why I can start the sermon with, we're not going to do it like this in ways that has been done in the past. This is a living word that we engage with, that we're invited to have a conversation with. Jesus reminds us that we read the scripture and study the scripture as an ongoing experience with a living God and a living word. They're meant to be a way of God's ways of getting within us, within our hearts, within our communities. And as members of a shalom community, of a beloved community, he's inviting us to honor ourselves and others, honor our bodies, honor the ways that we are faithful to one another, about the ways that we try our best to bring wholeness and righteousness. about what we've been taught about these issues in our past, about how we treat people, how we see people through different lenses, whether that's by gender or by race or by economics. How does that shape how we honor people fully and completely and complexly? That the systems he's challenging are often unequal. How do we find ways to create that equality? How we treat people, how we love people, how we see people. That it matters in our hearts, and what happens in our hearts affects what happens in our actions, and what happens in our action shapes how we become a whole community how we bring more peace, how we bring more harmony, how we bring more completeness, how we bring more welfare and tranquility. One of the best examples of this, Mark and I have a picture hanging at our door. I guess guess it's a picture, but it's a framing of a quote by, shockingly, Thomas Merton. I know you're shocked that there's a Merton quote hanging in my house. But he had this experience, this glimpse of what this might look like or feel like. And it doesn't stay forever. But I think part of what Jesus is asking us in how we see each other and how that affects how we live with each other and how we love each other is this idea that Merton comes across. And I love that it happens in an ordinary moment. He says this, he says, in Louisville at the corner of 4th and Walnut, in the center of a shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people, that they were mine and I was theirs, that we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation in a special world, the world of renunciation and supposed holiness. They were mine and I was theirs. Jesus uses these real-world examples to help them understand what is at the core of a beloved community. How do we love all people equally? And when we do that, we are showing God love. He uses these examples as symptoms of a heart problem. Just as now Jesus lived in a time where people weren't treated equally, men and women, Roman citizens and Jews, the poor and the rich. Depending on your status in any of those categories, you may have had unequal power over others. He invites us to think about how we treat those who have less power or more power than us matters in creating a community of shalom and of wholeness. How we as a community stand up against the mistreatment of people, how we stand up against inequality, and how we stand for shalom and for wholeness matters. He's saying that some of what 
being a disciple looks like. The sermon, this very long sermon that we've been listening to, is about what discipleship looks like in action. He says later in the sermon, he says, You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? He says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Again, no problem, right? But perfect to God is about wholeness. How do you seek wholeness? This doesn't mean we aren't humans and we don't make mistakes ever. It doesn't mean we don't get angry or have wrong thoughts What he's saying is, you're not doing this alone. Last week, we talked about being salt and light for the glory of God. This week, it is about the fact that God has already told you that you are enough. God has already told you that you are beloved, that you are covered in God's grace and God's mercy. So you do not attempt this community. You do not attempt this way of being alone. You do it with every good gift that God has ever given you, including some of these commandments, including some of these ways of being, including some of these ways of reflecting on our own hearts about where we have also seen the world fragmented and ourselves be fragmented. How do we move towards wholeness? We do it with the help of God. We do it with the help of a community. We do it with the help of a congregation of people all pointing, hopefully in the same direction, seeking that wholeness together. I heard somebody say this week, maybe the most courageous thing we can ever do is get up and try again tomorrow. And then get up and try again Tomorrow. Jesus is asking us to be courageous, but does not leave us to ourselves. He leaves us with a community. He leaves us with a loving and a powerful God. We're about to enter the season of Lent. And next week's kind of going to be a primer of all things Lent, because I love Lent. It's going to be about what we celebrate. It's going to be about the rituals and the practices. But ultimately, it's about talking about the heart of our community and reflecting on that for six weeks, how our hearts work together towards mending and bringing wholeness to the suffering and the fragmented parts of this world in a season of repentance. How are we going to receive God's blessings including on our vulnerabilities like we heard about a few weeks ago? How are we going to show and share the world by being salt and light? How are we going to face the inequalities of the world head on? The ones that we see here and now in 2023, both as individuals but also as a congregation. How are we going to invite God to help us with that? That's why we don't skip the hard parts of the sermon. Because we do it with God. We don't get to skip the challenges that Jesus lays before us because he's inviting us to look both at ourselves and our systems that we're working within and challenge the status quo. It doesn't have to stay fragmented. It doesn't have to stay unequal. It doesn't have to stay that way. It can be more. And we do that by embracing a radical kind of love, a radical way of being that involves love for, friend, love for friends and enemies alike. 
And when we do that, we too might also get a glimpse, like Merton on that corner, of a community made of shalom, made of right relationship, one that is shining like the sun.